Welcome to the Arts to Hearts podcast, a show where we take a peek into the hearts and lives of our favorite artists. From running a creative business and practice to mindset, we talk about everything that goes behind into making a life and a career that you adore as an artist. Think of this as your happy hour with your favorite artist in your studio. Hear them share the messy and the wonderful side of creating and living a creative heartfelt life within and outside our studios. As you tune in, be ready to be inspired and encouraged. I'm your host Charuka Arora an artist designer entrepreneur and founder of Arts to Hearts project thank you so much for being here let's jump right in hello everyone welcome back to the arts to hearts podcast i'm super excited to have you here today i'm so happy to have you guys here today to this super special episode not with one not with two but four contemporary women artists from across the globe We have four amazing women who are here with us today for a very fun beautiful conversation that we're hoping to have with you share with you. So in April we launched our first ever open call for the podcast. The theme for this open call was Garden of Nostalgia. We received an overwhelming amount of submissions and are finally super elated to bring these four women from across the globe to you right here. Let me introduce you to Sara, Gina, Raisa, and Juliet. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Hi, Sara. Hi. Hi. This is Sarah. I'm so excited to be here. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. It's it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Hi, Juliet. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Okay, guys. Since we have you here, before we go into the episode, I really wanted you guys to introduce yourselves so that our listeners know who you are, where you come from, and what you do. Sara, would you like to introduce yourself first? Of course. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Renzi Sanders. I am a mixed media surreal artist and mother of three. Uh, I was born in Washington D.C. and I. live about 10 miles outside of DC now in Kensington Maryland with my family and I have work out of my home studio and I really don't have much educational background I just loved art growing up so much and I was always painting and drawing as a kid and then I minored in art in college I actually got rejected <laughs> from being an art major <laughs> which is hard to do <laughs> but you know I like I'm glad it was a blessing now I get to just do it for me and like explore myself I think if it was if I was in the education like arts I would have it would have made me not like it as much right now it's like helping me discover my soul myself you know that's buried beneath being a mother and wife and artist and friend and everything that women are burdened with <laughs> Sorry, that was a long answer. No, absolutely not. Thank you so much, and we can't wait to know more about you. Raisa, would you like to come next? Yes, hi, my name is Raisa Nosova. I was born in Russia, and I moved to the United States when I was eleven years old. My education is more on the formal track. I got my undergraduate degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology. I also studied abroad in Brussels. and i actually just got my mfa degree from nyu i graduated a week ago wow congratulations <laughs> um, thank you and um i've also done a couple of residencies i've done the berlin art institute and the eileen askuminski family foundation residency in jersey city i'm now based in new york area and i i'm a founder of supernosova it's an art um program for youth focusing on portfolio preparation i've also been a professor an adjunct professor at nyu and i guess on top of everything and most importantly i am a mom of a 2 year old oh wow we have two moms here already thank you so much for introducing yourself raisa thanks a ton okay gina let's go hear he- you now hi everyone i'm gina i go by Gina Arico um on Instagram and for all my art stuff um I'm a Seattle based painter um and I have um also a kind of formal art background I studied um studio art in English literature at Santa Clara University in California and minored in art history 
Um, I, when I was in school, didn't, I, I loved art. I like secretly wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know if I really had it in me. So um, I also got English and felt like, oh, <laughs> maybe something safer I can do with this. But um, I'm glad I was able to study both together because for me, um, storytelling is so much a part of the art that I make and the way I understand art and how I want to communicate myself. Um, so I actually see like a lot of overlap with those two, even though I'm not like, I don't write written stories. Um, I, I think like the narrative quality helps me. Um, and yeah. Perfect, thank you. Lastly, we have here um, Juliet with us, Juliet Martin. Uh, Juliet, would you like to introduce yourself please? Hi, I'm Juliet. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I went to graduate, I was a virtual art, a studio artist in college. And then I went to graduate school for computer art. And that's when I started taking things that are not traditionally used for arts to use those to break into a different dimension of showing and displaying work. So I worked a lot making web-based art pieces. So it was an actual website and the website itself would be an art piece. And then I moved on from there. And after a few different other attempts of stuff, I ended up weaving. So I was taking a loom, which is very functional and making non-functional, non-functional visual work with it. And it's compared to something you would wear. Wow. Fantastic. I can see those sets in the background and that seems like yeah I, think I, I, I put those there. up there <laughs> yeah and I think I've seen this on your Instagram maybe or, or your website somewhere okay so garden of nostalgia we're all here for garden of nostalgia while thinking of this theme for this open call we came to the idea of nostalgia as a common thread for majorly each one of us and how every day we walk into our lives with memories of the past intertwined with like present and future in one or the other way the way we live and create today is a reflection of what we've experienced in our in our, our lives respectively what's actually unique about this is that how we curate these memories and we how we create these memories and have our own gardens a place where we store our, our moments our thoughts our experiences and this really uh, striked us when we were thinking about opening this podcast call. We really wanted to choose a subject which is not only relevant otherwise, but also in today's time, like now, how in the past one, one and a half years, all of us have spent so much of our time um, in isolation and have really hold on to uh, a lot of memories from the past. For this open call, we received some very interesting and promising views and submissions with this idea. And here we are today to talk with these four amazing artists and their perceptions and their ideas of Garden of Nostalgia. Uh, before we get into it, I really quickly wanted to say a big thank you for to Aradhita as well. And I also wanted to um, Aradhita to introduce herself to our listeners because all of you know me, um, myself, Charaka, and I am generally the one who you listen. But Radhita also works with me behind the scene, and I thought that it would be a great idea to have her on the call today with us. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Radhita. Hi, thank you for having me here, finally. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here and being a part of this interesting conversation with four of the most amazing artists we found <laughs> in the past couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything that you do behind the scenes. And it feels great to have you here with us today, finally. So I hope all of us have fun today. That's, that's the idea. I have my first question to all of you. And let's start with what is nostalgia for you? Let's hear from you, Juliet. For me, I want to say within visual art especially, I feel that nostalgia is something you create to maybe describe something that meant something different to you at the time. So maybe at the time it seemed romantic and lovely, but then when you look back and you try to reflect upon those, those issues, you can either romance it or go in the opposite direction. So partially I feel like nostalgia is 
what happens that happened before and, and that is now happening in, in a present moment. Awesome. That sounds amazing. How do you experience nostalgia, Sara? Can you, can you share what it means to you? Yes. Um, so I um, have three children. I had my daughter very young. And um, when I had her, it was like when she would play with the dolls and the Barbies, I would look at them in a different way. So the Barbies, you're like, no, this is not what women look like. You know, like I don't want my child playing with this at the same time as a child, like the feeling of getting a Barbie that for me, that's nostalgia. Like that was so exciting. And um, yeah, it's just really hard to like, you know, it's hard to raise a teenager, but nostalgia for me, it's really a feeling. It's like a feeling that I get and I want through my art. I want people to feel that feeling. Love that. You know, I want them things to be familiar. Wonderful. Perfect. Sarah, I, I'm sorry. Sarah, I wish you could see my room. I have like 20 Barbies on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple in my window right now. <laughs> okay, I would say, I would say myself, I have like a big chest where I store like um, my old, old toys and like little moments of uh, things that just make me remind of all of these things so it feels like it just travels us back to time back in time actually okay I think that child likeness is important absolutely to have that like in your life and I love that how you have integrated that in your work itself yeah amazing let's hear from you Gina what is nostalgia to you yeah thank you nostalgia is where I get a lot of my inspiration personally I'm Um, mixed race, first generation American. My parents moved from Japan to the US when my mom was pregnant with me. I'm the firstborn in my family. Um, And I think like I I draw a lot from um, like old family albums that I have and um, and a lot of the art I make, like I just did a series where I painted the collected objects um, like ceramic, Japanese ceramics that some of them have been in my family for like over a hundred years, like passed down from my great, great grandmother, you know, to my great grandmother, to grandmother, to my mom, to me. Um, and I, th- I think part of it is because I spent a lot of time here, like not knowing exactly where I fit in and kind of looking backwards felt like, you know, what happens when you look at the past, there's comfort there. And it did kind of almost feel like putting puzzle pieces together. Like, why am I here? Where do I belong? Like looking backwards, I got a lot of comfort from that. And, um, and a lot of curiosity too, especially since I grew up in the US, like looking at photos, it's a totally different life that my, even my mother and my grandmother had in Japan looking um, looking at like her first day of school pictures and stuff and being like, I wonder what, what that was like to go to school in Japan. Like, so it brought up like, there's like a level of comfort and a, for me, like a level of, of curiosity that gives my art, like inspires a lot of my art. Yeah, that actually really is a good uh, way, I think, it's not only really like when it is about, um, you know, it, especially like you've moved countries, but like even when like I moved, um, I, I moved my out of my parents out 10 years ago. And, you know, often I would find myself like looking back and um, getting nostalgic about how small towns versus bigger cities and like living alone versus living with family and it, how it makes you feel. Yeah. Well, and I'll say my, my Jichan, uh, my grandparents, my mom's parents, they still live in the same house that my mom grew up in. Wow. So like when I look at those old photos, it's it's like they're standing in front of the same house, um, like the house that when I go to visit, it's the same place. Yeah. So there's that level too. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Raisa, let's come to you. Mm-hmm. What does nostalgia I, mean to you? To me, nostalgia is in a way a, so- a source of energy it's when we look back to certain parts of our lives that are most likely positive in some way. And we understand that we can't relive them and it's probably unhealthy to try to bring that into our present or the future, right? Because we always want to grow um, and it's not a healthy thing to maybe idealize what the future would be. But to me, these memories, these positive memories have been giving me a really great amount of energy at times when I'm stuck 
I think that's when I think back the most to, um, you know, to something that's happened. That sounds amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you for sharing your ideas with us. Before we move forward, um, I wanted to ask you guys, why did you apply to this theme called Garden of Nostalgia? And how is nostalgia integrated in your work? And why were you, in fact, like pulled to be here? Let's hear from you, Gina. Oh, I loved the topic Garden of Nostalgia. Um, literally in my artist bio on my website, I talk about how like nostalgia is one of my influences or um, inspirations for my work. And I think Garden also, the, the idea that memories are not things that are fixed that you can like cleanly store and file, right? That like, depending on your mood or you can like forget things and remember them again later. I think that kind of growth and like unkemptness uh, is what like garden brought to mind, particularly around garden of nostalgia. Cause it makes me think of just the way we forget and remember and romanticize our memories in past experiences. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Raisa, can you talk about how is nostalgia integrated in your work and why did you apply to Garden of Nostalgia? So my recent work, um, it deals with the conflict of the experience of motherhood, the conflict between the, the raw challenges that are, you know, the body goes through the visceral, the sleepless nights, but the contrast of, you know, the pure love and the happiness and the joy that you get out of it. Um, and in relation to nostalgia, this is what, this is an experience that you go through uh, kind of half awake, <laughs> literally in that sense. So nostalgia comes in as a very direct um, topic in this, yeah. as, I'm, as I'm going through this. So when I saw the open call for this, I thought this was a perfect opportunity to talk about what my work is. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we really are looking forward to know more about your work. Juliet, would you like to share how is nostalgia integrated in your work and what calls you here? Um, what was interesting to me is that I, in the pieces that I submitted, uh, it's called, called Household Objects Remind Me of You, is I created a history and I use nostalgia to give it emotion and to give it a, a, a context. So in, although mine seems very real and very present, I'm really taking the opportunity of nostalgia on something that actually didn't have. And that was important to me. Wonderful. I love the one that actually we are going to talk in this conversation where you included those um, safety pins. And I really actually love how, um, in fact, your tech, like your material was also something that really made me nostalgic because um, I grew up in a household and I grew up in India and looking at those fabrics and the texture and those colors, um, somehow like, you know, how we were even talking about, about nostalgia, the same thing could make someone feel, remember, make them remind of something that um, nobody has an intent of. But yes, I mean, I've, I've definitely had this, I, this constructed history and what does this constructed history mean to someone? And then when you find out what it is, you know, wh or whatever is may be. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. Perfect, thank you. Um, Sarah, here we are with you. Okay, what, uh, how is, how is uh, nostalgia integrated in your work? <laughs> I am here because I've been following you for a while, Truga. I just love what you're doing. I love your work. I love that you're trying to build the women artists community because it's so needed right now. And um, Garden of Nostalgia was just, when I heard that, I was like, oh, I could totally name my series Garden of Nostalgia. You know, it felt so perfect because my work right now, um, or this past series, it's called Unmasking the Self. So it was for me all about going into my childhood and uncovering like traumas and anxieties and like the roots of fear and putting that out in my work to heal like my inner child. So 
I mean, the topic was perfect. I always put little artifacts from childhood in these pieces. Like I have the ruby slippers and the spinning wheel and, you know, kind of fairy tale imagination, you know, like kids imaginations. I want you to feel like you're inside a kid's imagination. I feel absolutely like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think that it's just, it, it's, it makes it more palatable and like, it wasn't that scary, but like you just, it's like loving my inner child and like acknowledging you as an authentic person before all the layers of masks were put on to hide your emotions, to hide your mental health. I mean that like as girls were just so taught to just put on the mask, put on the mask, put on the mask. And so a lot of my work is about, you know, the masks, obviously. Love that. Are the uh, characters in your work, the girls that you often meet, um, do they have like, do you see yourself into it or is it your your children or like, is there so, something that comes from the past? The, the painting, um, there's no place like home that's behind me. That's the one that you chose. Yeah. Um, that is me and my twin sister. And that was wow. the first, the first painting of the series. And it was, um, I was trying to go back to my first memory of theater and being separated from my twin sister going into kindergarten it was so traumatic because I'd never been separated from this person. It was like, I just remember that as being so terrifying. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Okay. Now that we're talking about childhood, nostalgia, looking in the past, I am going to ask my favorite question because um, with every interview, the fav- more, my most favorite thing, and I think the entire reason for starting this podcast was not only to talk about our work, but to talk about who you are. Why are you making the work that you're making? Uh, how you grew up? How is How has your life actually affected uh, who you are today as an artist and what you're making as an art? You know, let's talk, talk about your childhood, like growing up and some of your favorite memories uh, that have shaped you today, that, that have not only uh, shaped your work, but who you are and uh, your belief system, because I believe as artists, our work is an extension of who we are. And it, it shows um, what we believe in, um, our ideas, our thoughts. So I just want to hear, hear from you. Let's hear from you, Juliet. How was your childhood? How did you grow up? Could, do you have like one memory that you really feel has shaped who, who you are today? Yes, I do. And it's sort of a funny one. It's going to sound more like a joke, but oh, we love when, I was in fourth, <laughs> when, when I was in fourth grade for Halloween, I dressed as a real estate agent for <laughs> Century 21. And I did that because I loved their logo. I love the typeface. I love the color. I wanted to wear that camel blazer. Like, I don't know if you guys are old enough. I'm super old. So I had that camel blazer and it sounds crazy, but that was like very indicative that I wanted to be able to use art. I wanted to take art and make it into something powerful for someone else so like if I can hold up this century 21 sign and communicate to that to someone because they know the brand they know the color like that was so fascinating to me love that okay um Raisa let's hear from you so I grew up in Russia in a not so well-off neighborhood um we didn't really have much money. It was the 90s, you know, post-Soviet regime where my parents' salaries came in like sacks of sugar or, you know, boxes of toilet paper. There were really scary times now that I'm looking back as an adult or as a parent. Um, And one thing that my mom would always focus on was, you know, regardless what's happening in our hood or what's happening, um, you know, in the house, you know, if we didn't have the means to fix the ceiling leaking or the cracks of, you know, in the walls, she left my sister and me with watercolor or gouache paints and paper. And she just wanted us to create beautiful things. And she would do um, origami and collage with us. So that was, you know, my growing up. And when I was nine, my mom came to the United States. She had an opportunity to come here um, to me 
our extended family and they convinced her to stay. And the immigration process actually took about a year and a half. So I think that that separation, or I'm pretty sure that that separation from my mom, it, you know, did some things to me that I couldn't really process as a child. Um, and once we had the opportunity to come to the United States, then I was ripped away from, you know, my home, my grandma who raised me. So again, there were things that I had to process. And now I'm in a new country where I barely spoke the language. So art really became, I guess, my thing. And it was kind of unconscious, right? I was just, well, I like art. I like painting. It's fun, right? Those are my thoughts at the time. But of course, now looking back, that's just, that was my way of dealing with everything and processing everything. I think um, you are the second person I know now. Um, we had Kat um, on the podcast. Um, I don't know if you know her, but- Yes, she's um, amazing. Yeah, so she she actually has shared a lot about her experience that you're also talking about, and I feel so bad, but I, I can actually really relate to what you're saying right now because the past one and a half year in India hasn't been- hasn't really been uh, good and a lot of us are feeling that anxiety of uh, feeling insecure unsafe and I think that's um, that's this is this is a kind of trauma that nobody can undo and let go ever I mean you could just can't how has this experience um, translated in your work I actually haven't so once I moved here I had somewhat of a happy childhood, you know, growing up in Russia, it was during the Chechnya war and I'm right, I used to live right on the border. So wow. I had moments growing up where I was very conscious of, you know, not just World War II because um, for Russia, it's a, you know, a very proud mm -hmm. uh, point of history. But I remember being told by my parents, like, don't step on some shiny wrapper on the street. It could be an explosive. This was my reality growing up. And then I moved here and I got this carefree childhood that I, you know, kind of saw on the television. And, you know, the focus was as an immigrant family to get our feet on the ground, work, help work with your family as a team, yeah. um, get into college and so on. So these ideas of, um, you know, trauma have kind of sunk very deep. It wasn't until I was in, in grad school that, um, so before grad school, my work was primarily for the last five years um, on the topic of aftermath of genocide. I went to Cambodia, had a grant to go there. I was very curious how the people are dealing with a more recent war than yeah. you know, the World War II uh, that my grandparents survived. So I kept talking about this um, aftermath of war and how are people dealing with the trauma and I couldn't figure out why, you know, I, I was so drawn to this. Later I realized, you know, it was these things that I was suppressing from my own family. But once I got into grad school, um, I was told to put that on the side, put that to the side and try to think of something even more personal, something that's not necessarily, that has to do with my family, but something very, unique to me and I kept digging and thinking what is worth speaking about that could be you know as important as what's happening let's say at the time in Syria and one of the visiting artists to the studio uh Rodel Milan he actually kind of like he literally like sucked it out of me and I remembered that I was separated from my mom and it was actually a big deal and he kind of um, gave me the, the energy to start digging into it a little bit and think back about it. And, you know, he made the point, the connection of what was happening at the border at the time with the children being separated from their parents that I had somewhat, you know, of an experience. It's not as horrible. Um, I still had my family. I was still at home when I was separated. Yeah. But Man, I'm so sorry you had to go through that, but I'm so happy that um here you are um doing all the wonderful things um and raising a wonderful child so that um, it doesn't kill us makes us stronger right <laughs> yeah I I actually actually that's actually true I'm going through a very hard time but um every day every passing painful day just uh, makes you realize that you can live through another painful day and you get stronger there's no other way about it there's just no other way about it. Thank you so much for sharing this, though. Um, I really appreciate that. Okay, Sarah, let's hear from you. Um, okay. I actually really want to hear about 
how was your childhood and how you were as a child growing up i mean you'd be surprised i was really really shy and i Why was you? really really scared i was really scared all the time like of saying the wrong thing i was super reserved good student like never was going to step out of line i w- i went to catholic school and i mean you know the nuns the skirts everything like from kindergarten through eighth grade i mean through high school actually wow yeah so it was like you know you stay in your place girls are quiet girls are pious you know <laughs> you don't speak your mind you're you're the like be the good girl all the time Um so that's how I grew up but um my mom had always set up an art room for us whatever house we were living in so I was the oldest of five siblings and we would all just it, it was just a room that was constantly a mess <laughs> and we would just had tables and art supplies actually this cabinet I have next to me was in that art my childhood art room oh, wow yeah and it was just great and we had woods behind our house and we would play in the woods and explore and i always had a deep connection to nature and my work and um were yeah, you spending most of your time in haunted haunted houses while you were young <laughs> was i painting haunted houses were you living in those ha- um oh <laughs> no <laughs> um i mean I lived in a a kind of a crazy house at one point. It was like a rental house for one summer, if for 3 months and it was infested with bugs and um we had we had to have some place for us to live for like a few months like a few months in the summer. So it was like our only option was this like condemned house and we lived there for 3 months and it was it was horrible, but I kind of loved it. I always liked that kind of darkness yeah. and adventure. I was always very adventurous. Like I love snakes. I love, you know, black cats. Everything and... that we see in your paintings now. Yeah, frogs. <laughs> how how yeah. did your interest in something like in a topic like this um which is like this mystical haunted um get into you? I don't know. From the time I was a child I was really obsessed like not obsessed but fascinated with death. And I I just always was. I I loved scary movies. I loved ghost stories. I wanted a ghost to be my friend. It was just I really wanted that. <laughs> and my twin sister and I are both really into graveyards and um and there was been a lot of death in my family. Like I went to a lot of funerals as a child cuz my family was um Italian immigrants and all the old older yeah. like first generation that had come to the country. you know that were in their 80s they all died like around the same time when i was like 10 9 so it was like i was going to all these funerals and um just kind of learning about death in like not se- such a close way which i yeah. think makes it a little more digestible but still just like what's on the other side like what does that mean where is this person going you know yeah and like i really do feel like you know we're all connected to the spirit world in some way amazing yeah. love that thank you for all the amazing work that you're making actually oh thank you okay let's hear from you dina yeah i love um i love that we're just like diving right into this and everyone's stories are are so fascinating to listen to um like i said i i grew up in the us um but my mom she's the only one who who left so her whole family still live like in and around her hometown um and i'm now that i'm an adult i'm like super appreciative of this but um she my parents went through a lot of effort to save up and plan ahead and we'd try to take me and my sister um back every other summer so like once every two years we'd go and stay for a couple weeks with like stay in my grandparent the my mom's childhood home and like stay with relatives and be in Japan um and my jichan and bachan which is my grandparents they were both professional artists um they they're both oil painters uh like mainly oil painters um and so their the house when like when we would go to Japan and stay with them um <laughs> like you walk into the house and there's this 
big studio kind of front and center that they would teach art classes from there too. So like the walls are just lined with still life objects, um, you know, like fabric flowers and bowls of plastic fruit and stuff. And then just like buckets of um, paint brushes and, and rows of crayons and pencils and paints. Um, and then like off to the side, there's like a tiny kitchen, a tiny bathroom and like one bedroom. And then you go upstairs and there's like a big giant studio, <laughs> and, like, t- like just stacks of oh, this life. And sketchbooks, like up to the wall. Yeah. Or like, you know, up to the ceiling <laughs> and, and then there's like a, another bedroom kind of like <laughs> off to the side, but most of their house was a studio and there were always, well, especially because we would visit in the summers, there would be like um, art students, everyone like coming in and out of the house for like private lessons and stuff. Um, so it was very centered in that experience. And from, and then, so for me, like when you, when you first asked the question of like, think of a childhood memory, the first one that came to mind, um, like they, they both painted in a kind of impressionist style and with like heavy palette knife, like very textured, um, mm-hmm paintings and I remember as a kid just thinking it was so like magical like I could get super close up to the canvas and just see the heavy blobs of colors and textures and and then step back and be like oh it's a sailboat it's a (laughs) it's a city whatever the the image was and being like how does that work how like how do you make it look like the thing um I wanted to know how to do that it really felt like some kind of like there was some kind of secret, some kind of magic to it. Um, I wanted to learn how to paint like that. And there's like a sunny, like the sunny side of that. Like I I have all these like very, very close memories about that time there. And like, obviously it had a very direct influence on me. Like it made me want to be a painter too. Um, But because we could only get over there so often and my Japanese language is is very poor. Like my my skill level is really low. Hmm. Obviously they don't speak English. Um, And so I did kind of have a, a push pull of um, loving being able to be there and loving being able to paint paint with them and watch yeah. them paint and and show them my finished artwork. <laughs> like it felt really good because they they like encouraged me a lot. Yeah. Um, but on the that's like the sunny side of it, and then the shadow side is kind of like I didn't have other ways to really yeah. communicate mm-hmm. with them. Yeah. And I spent there were such long stretches of time between when I saw them where like I wished we could be closer. I wished we could communicate more. Um, And so I think that's also why like nostalgia comes into play. Yeah. Because there's that kind of longing or like, yeah. yeah. A way that you can connect to your loved ones. Thank you so much for sharing. I love how distinct we've heard all of your stories and how, how all of us have had really different experience. And I really feel like how, uh, how unique we are but also how similar we are how how we've um we found art as a common point for all of us uh to translate our um our our memories and what we are feeling which which brings me to my next question is and why really we um we decided to go ahead with this theme um in, of course, since the pandemic, all of us have been in isolation and that brings a lot of other burden, like, you know, people who are in different countries, they can't, they can't travel back. Um, we can't move out from our houses. We can't meet our loved ones. We can't hug our loved ones. Often people would say like, you know, I can't wait. Um, we can't wait to go back to the normal life, which we, I, I really don't know what would mean now especially now in India the we've had the second uh, a horrible horrible second wave and it's still really bad here but um, we in these uh, entire time and we don't know how long more uh, I think all of us have tried to hold on to a lot of memories um, memories of the past Um, my question is ever since the pandemic has hit um, we all have evolved because our experiences like they've changed and they've changed who we are as a person because um, our surroundings affect us. And how has your definition of nostalgia or role of nostalgia shaped during this time? Let's hear from you, Raisa. 
so when the pandemic hit, I was living with my husband and my baby in a one bedroom in Brooklyn with windows that didn't open uh, because of, I guess, insurance <laughs> of the building. Um, and we were really stuck and both, I was teaching classes. I was a professor at NYU, was trying to teach on Zoom. My husband had phone calls. We kept running between the two rooms, the kitchen and the, the bedroom. I remember we had this huge air conditioning unit. It took about half of the wall. And once it would turn on, it literally sounded like the, you know, the airplane. <laughs> so it was, it was really frustrating. And with a 10 months old at the time, who was right at the age of crawling around and putting everything in his mouth. You know, it was, it was definitely a challenge and I was honestly losing it a little bit, um, you know, on top of the fact that we had to stack up on things or not stack up, wear masks or not wear masks. We had to question what's going to be available in the stores. On top of that, I had this question of, I don't even know what my son will need in two weeks, you know, based on yeah. his growing and development. Do I, Am I going to run out of my own milk? Do I buy formula for how long? <laughs> you know, so it was it was quite stressful, and I would say in the way life got real. Yeah. In that spring 2020, uh, having having you know be responsible for another human yeah. being in the midst of this, but this feeling of having to create, you know, as an artist, it was still there. I had to put it on the back burner, of course. And as soon as my studio building opened up in September, um, I was back there and I actually started working with glass uh, when I started my MFA degree in 2018. So as soon as the glass studio in Brooklyn opened up, uh, Urban Glass, I was back in there and I had so much accumulated tension that I really needed to get out all these concepts. And my work became more conceptual. I guess that period of time, the quarantine, um, you know, it energized so much thought. And I, yeah. as a painter, it's a lot, paintings are a lot more immediate. You have this relationship with, yeah. with your canvas as a painter, you kind of let it all out. Um, it's more, I guess, um, emotional. Yeah. And I find sculpture, which is something I have not really been a sculptor since, you yeah. know, doing a few sculpture classes in undergrad. I, over the course of last year, I now kind of became a sculptor. Um, so it's, it's a bit more conceptual. It's not as immediate, but it's a lot more real for me what I'm seeing yeah. through my sculpture. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Juliet, um, has the pandemic changed your work in some way? Are you, um, are you looking at some kind of nostalgia while you were uh, making work in fact while we're just having this conversation I, I something struck me and you know while you're saying Raisa you were away from your studio I think this is also a kind of nostalgia that most of us have dealt with uh, most of us um, had to move away from our spaces that we were uh, we were in a habit of working from and we needed to move I just improvise and I, I know for a fact that all of us had to like like we always kept on saying like, you know, we wanted to go back to the studio and always looking at the time that the work that we've done there. So, um, and I think it does bring a lot of change in our work. And it, I think it just evolves more than anything else. Juliet, would you like to share your experience with us? So both my husband and I work at home. So when the pandemic first started happening, we were kind of like, we can't go outside, but we don't go outside anyway. Um, and, um, and we have a very nice space. So we didn't even see, you know, we're not, we're, we're apart, but what started happening was like, I normally would draw like people and animals. And I noticed I was like, I'm drawing furniture and I'm, in, I'm drawing pots and pans and I'm drawing coffee cups. And at the same time, when my husband would take the trash out, I would get really freaked out. I'd be like, what if he doesn't come back? What if COVID hits him and I'm all by myself? And I realized I was afraid of losing my husband. I was afraid because I couldn't see my friends. I was afraid because I wouldn't see my family. And that's why I was embracing all of these objects that wouldn't let me down. Yeah. You know, I was like, I can be friends with that sofa and that sofa is going to be there and it will be there for me and it'll be there for me tomorrow. And I can count on that so much more than 
my husband taking out the trash. So I sort of created this like strange environment where, you know, I could like look at the fruit bowl and I know it'll be there. And so that sort of created this entire thing of like, I tried to choose objects that I felt had sort of a, a global understanding. You know, if you're, if you're looking at a bathtub, yeah. but now sitting in that bathtub is like being coddled by your, by your environment. Yeah. Love that. I really love how you, I think a lot of us, um, a lot of artists actually uh, started to respond to the immediate environment, like interiors, um, you know, green, re- nature, environment, um, because that was all that we had. I mean, there was no access to anything else. So that's really interesting that how- and my husband's like, my husband is like, are you trying to, is, is my death working out, you know, <laughs> it's like, are you, am I die? Are you going to like do so much better? I'm like, eh. um, yeah, <laughs> you'll do with the sofa. <laughs> he was like, how can you do it? Why are we romanticizing my death? I have a question to Juliet. Can I? Yeah, Go ahead, can... please. Love that. Uh, so Julie, so usually when, as artists, when we work on something, it doesn't hit us until quite later why we were creating and what the work was about, um, if you agree. I'm just curious, at what point did you realize this relationship, this answer that you just, which is amazing what you just told us, but when did you figure that out, that the reason why you were creating that work? Um, it's a good question. You know, I was I like in my, one thing I do every day, like, every day after I get up, I read art theory for a half an hour and then I draw for a half an hour. And like, I do that so rigorously, you would laugh. And so I'm (laughs) drawing every morning and I'm doing all this stuff. And then I started like sewing it into my weaving, but it really hit me because I was setting the table I don't set the table, you know, who sets the table for two people, but you know, I was like, and I was like, almost like putting out the plates. And then I sort of realized that I was really setting the table more for the table and less (laughs) for me and my husband. It was like, this is so the chair can have a place to sit. And this is so the cup can have a place to sit. So I mean, I'm, I'm making it silly, but that was sort of it. Like when I sort of realized that like, the way things were moving around my apartment, it was like, oh, I'm serving my table as much as the table is serving me. That's great. Yeah, you know. Um, Yeah, go ahead, Gina. (laughs) This is Gina speaking. Um, Juliet, so much of what you said, just like, I got a little emotional almost because it, like, that's exactly what I went through too. Um, That has been kind of my experience with the pandemic too, and it, showed up in a very similar way with the um like household specifically like kitchen household objects I got like suddenly very attached to them and um did did a whole bunch of paintings um specifically around um the collected ceramic objects from my mom's side of the family like teapots and teacups and sake cups um yeah the daima um and yeah, Tadaima, which means I'm home in Japanese, is what I ended up naming the series. Mm. Um, and yeah, as I was kind of working through them, I think like specifically, I have one teapot from Ariko, who's my my grandma, um, who I'm named after, Gina Ariko. Um, that one in particular, I did like multiple paintings of, um, and she passed away like over ten years ago. It's been a while, but. Um, at the start of the pandemic. So in April, 2020, my mom and I were supposed to go back to Japan. Um, That was kind of like the, when our next scheduled trip was supposed to be, obviously it got canceled. Um, And I had missed the year before, the the, the trip before for the first time in my life, which meant for me, April, 2020 would have been four years instead of the usual two since I last went. And I was completely devastated um, and I felt a lot of guilt around, I had the chance last time and I missed it. And, mm-hmm. and now I don't know what's going to happen, how long this pandemic is going to be. What if something happens to someone in our family gets sick? And um, I just really felt that separation and anxiety and it mm-hmm. kind of came out. I think something about those objects too, like because they've been our family so long and particularly Arikos, and she's 
physically not here anymore but like I knew that was like hers and she gave it to my mom and she gave it to me and just like that it still keeps its shape and it's still yeah. it's still around and it's exactly the same as it was yeah. um like I got a lot of it was very like self-soothing to like study those objects and think about how they have not changed <laughs> over yeah. the over the decades um I got really fixated on them and it was like I kind of helped me process my like homesickness and anxiety I think that's a great um topic because um since the pandemic a lot of us have tried to find comfort in physical objects instead of human beings um because I think because of the fear the untimeliness of the situation uh, we wanted something more permanent and I think that's could be that could be another reason let's hear from you Sarah um, well, we were really fortunate because we put a contract on a house and we were set to move in at the end of March and it was right before everything shut down. So we got to move, which was just the whole, yeah. the whole time the pandemic was happening. I was like, I am so grateful. I am so grateful that I'm not stuck in my old smaller house with boxes everywhere with my three kids home because that would be a nightmare but instead I had this my beautiful new home and a big yard for my kids to play in and you know it wasn't that bad other than the stress of having the kids home just like the constant migraines (laughs) but you know um it really allowed me to get back to nature I spent a lot of time outside Um, I spent a lot of time in the woods reflecting um, and I actually began my series Unmasking the Self pre-pandemic, but um, I finished it during the pandemic. So the last four of the series, you can kind of see a shift. My work, it's darker. It's very dark. Trying to go back to a place that felt very dark and kind of exposing myself in this way, because I know I'm not going to be seeing people in person. And it's like, who cares? I don't care what you think of me anymore. That was what I really let go of. Like, like this is me. I'm going out like no makeup on. Who cares? This is like, we're all just surviving here, you know? And my work just became whatever I wanted it to be. It's therapy for me. And if therapy for me is, drawing myself like drowning like Ophelia then I'm gonna do it you know (laughs) because I have to go back to those dark places to heal them because my daughter is going through that experience right now yeah absolutely yeah she's 14 so I that's what really that having a 14 year old home with you during a pandemic (laughs) I mean she was pretty miserable and I had to go back to that place for myself yeah I put myself in her shoes, like heal myself before I could heal her because I can't do anything for her or help her heal herself. You know, all I can do is try to relate. And for me going back to those dark times of high school and college and childhood, like I go back to the darkness. Uh, That's actually a very relevant point. And I think a lot of parents, artist parents have had similar kind of experiences and I really, I think hats off to artist parents because um, I think being in the pandemic with kids and looking after them and not only managing yourself, but also looking after your kids and their well-being. I'm, I mean, it's, it, it, it is a lot of hard work. So yeah. shout out to all you amazing mothers. So we are through with some really interesting conversations. And I have another question, which is um, actually respectively for all of you. Um, we saw um, your submissions and we had some really great work from you. So we thought, why not, um, why not like do a little brief and hear from you about a little bit about one of one each of your works. So we've simply um, selected one and we'd actually let you know before. Um, to our listeners, you can actually see these works on the show notes. The link to the show notes is in the description below. So you can just click on the link and you can see see the, the work that we're talking about. Let's start with you, Gina, at first, actually. The work that we would like to hear a little bit about, uh, in, in brief, actually, is um, 
artists at work and can you talk about what you were thinking and what made what brought it to life yes thank you um you really chose the perfect piece for the topic of garden of nostalgia because Absolutely. um <laughs> the <laughs> my painting artists at work is based on a, an old black and white photo. It's my personal favorite photo that um, I have of my grandparents, Ariko and Shigetoshi and my grandma and grandpa. The, f- the photo I have of them is from decades ago, like decades before I was born. Um, Ariko is sitting at the easel, my grandmother, and then Shige, my grandpa, is kind of like looking over her shoulder. And they're, so they're both standing at the easel and then the walls around them are also just stacked up with other other paintings. Um, and yeah, I kind of like oh, everything we've been piece, saying. Actually. I love the intensity yeah. of that piece and it just feels like you become a part of that process because as artists, we can actually feel that moment. We can really see um, mm-hmm. anyone who, who's interested in the arts, they know what it means. Um, thank you so much. Okay, Raisa, this is actually um, my and Aradhita's favorite work that we saw of yours. Um, and we really want to know more about it. We've actually read in the bio. But would you like to share more about I Smell Like My Mother? I Smell Mother, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my first semester in grad school, I found out that I was pregnant. And there was a lot of guilt trip that I, I went through in that whole first year because I finally got into a master's program. I waited about eight years to get into it after getting my BFA. It wasn't my first time applying that I got in on. So finally I'm in this program and I have to, you know, create and push myself and overachieve and anything else that we do as artists (laughs) to make it. But there was this, you know, physical weight that I was going through that I was bearing, you know, shortness of breath, this fatigue, constant having to nap like three times a day in my sleeping bag in the studio. And there was this guilt trip because I wasn't creating, I wasn't productive. And the only thing that I got out of myself was that I wanted to try something new. And I already started working with glass and uh, I also wanted to try performance. And one thing that I did, I, I, I did get to do that. But in the entire first year after really not having any um, physical artwork that will be, you know, part of my MFA body of work. Um, I had given birth and now I didn't even have the time <laughs> to create. <laughs> so one of the things that I wanted to do was create a video in which I am pregnant and I'm attempting to stretch a canvas, but with tools that are made out of glass. So I was thinking about the parallel between the fragility of glass and pregnancy, but also the strength of both Uh, I was thinking about the invisibility of labor. Um, And as I was working on these tools, which took me about eight months to create, um, I was already breastfeeding and I had oversupply of milk and it ended up changing its taste that I was, the milk that I was feeding. And at some point my baby started refusing it because I was taking fish oil supplements and it changed taste. You know, it's (laughs) a whole thing I don't want to get into, but I had oversupply of frozen milk and I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't get rid of it. It was my, it was my well-being <laughs> in those bags. <laughs> and what I wanted to do, what I decided to do was to take the same molds for those tools, like hammer, saw, you know, a four inch brush that I just on my paintings, my uh, canvas with, and to use them as molds for milk. And I started freezing my milk in them. And, um, you know, this idea of memories slipping away and us trying to hold on to them, I decided to kind of take ownership of that. And yeah. what the work would become was about them, the milk sculptures melting. So it would become performance installation. So the way I have it set up is I would put tile on a pedestal and I would put the object, let's say a saw made out of breast milk and just let it melt fully, which would take about wow. two hours. And, you know, the idea was for it to be kind of like something you would do on an opening night of a a gallery and have people step on that milk. You know, there's a lot of connotation to to what breast milk is. I actually know, like we we read your submission and you you wrote about this work, but 
I did not know that um, it's, it's, it was meant to melt later. And I think that was a question that we had in our minds that um, what happens next? And you, you did let us know about it. Thank you so much. But yeah. um, it's actually, it's, it's a very interesting, um, it was very unusual work and uh, very striking. Like it really hits you hard. And I really wanted to know about it. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I was actually lucky to get a really talented videographer, Joey Palmieri, to come in and he was able to record the process. So now there is a video of this. On oh, my website. wow. <laughs> Can you share that video with us? I would love to add it to the um, to this video and to the show notes so that all of us can actually look yeah. at it. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, guys, I'm going to link this video um, here. And you can also find this video that I has mentioned in the show notes itself. Let's hear from you, Renzi. Would you like to share with us uh, your work? There is no place like home. Um, so there's no place like home was what I titled the piece of me and my twin sister on our first day of kindergarten. And my whole process is sort of... Um, I like to think of it as like an excavation, like I'm digging up memories, I'm, I'm dredging up like these uncomfortable feelings. Um, so that's kind of my shadow work. And I do that through meditation and journaling and trying to find the root of, because I have suffered from depression and anxiety my entire life. So I, I'm like, why am I like this? You know, <laughs> I want to find out. So I go back to childhood and um, this piece was my first memory of fear and um I have placed objects in it like the ruby slippers just there's no place like home I just wanted to go home so bad I felt so uncomfortable the doorways were scary so there's like a doorway behind me with dark eyes my sister and my hand um are like woven together with embroidery thread on the canvas and um the spinning wheel is from my grandmother's house she has wow. like a a spinning wheel from the 18, I think actually like the 1760s or something outrageous. Oh my God. Um, and it's like a family heirloom and my mom now has it. But for me back then, it was like so magical. She had it at the top of the stairs, we would walk up the staircase and we would play Sleeping Beauty. And that was just such a comforting memory for me. And then I placed the Virgin Mary in the background next to a wall of masks. Um, the wall of masks just was kind of, this was my first experience of being like, you can't cry and scream. You can't throw a tantrum. Like you have to put on the mask and yeah. smile and be nice to grownups and be a good girl yeah. or else you're going to get punished. And that's what it was like, you know, like you don't want to get humiliated. Like so much of like Catholic education is about humiliating children. Yeah. And um, I mean, not, it's not all terrible, but you know, we are told to stay in line. It is very strict and yeah. very conservative. And I did not, I never felt like I fit in that box, but I was always putting on the masks, being the good girl until I just exploded, you know, in my teens, just, I can't do it anymore. Um, and the snake kind of, for me, I love snakes and the snake symbolizes temptation, just you know, we're, we're always tempted and sometimes temptation isn't bad. Sometimes yeah. you can experience joy through like finding something new, but it, we were always just hammered in that like, no, you must stay on the path. You must be a good girl. You must put the mask on. You must be polite. And that gets you in trouble yeah. when you're in your teens and twenties and right. you don't know how to say no, you know? Love that. I think all of us can relate to that, especially like being born and brought up in India, I think every Indian woman, but in spite of that, I think globally, like we are all taught like that. Thank yes. you so much for sharing that. Uh, Juliet, would you like to um, talk about your work, uh, which is Grandma's Room on Monday? I love the name. Also, you had sent um, poetry with uh, alongside this and we requested you to recite maybe one stanza for us so yeah I can do that I have let me get it Here would you go. like to first talk about it and then maybe go with no I'd thing. actually like to read it first perfect then when you leave the apartment I'm afraid you won't come back 
and making portraits of my household items, memories that can be touched. The love seat doesn't replace you. It is a reminder of you. I'm alone before you are gone. So this again is part of the bigger group of pieces called Household Items Remind Me of You. About halfway through the collection, which was basically drawings on top of weaving, almost separate, you know, I had the woven fabric, I had the drawing, I sewed them together. And then the more I got into the whole collection, I wanted to sort of make it more cohesive. So the backgrounds were a combination of fabric I had woven, upholstery fabric that a friend of mine had given me, the drawings, and then also painting on top. So the, the, the canvas was a construction in itself. You know, the, the canvas was sort of patchwork with uh, yarn creating an irregular grid. And then to have that foundation, that sort of like very concrete uh, surface to then put furniture on top of it sort of gave it, gave it this like entire feeling of a room. And, uh, and in these pieces, like this one, for example, you know, I was drawing these sofas and I do a lot of looks on Google images and find ones that, that speak to me. And, you know, I found these, these sofas that like, they're so grandma, they're so grandma. <laughs> like they're one of my grandmas, like the other grandma would never have that. <laughs> but the one grandma, definitely. And so when I started creating these little places, there's like grandma's room on Wednesday. And then there's another one that's grandma's room on Friday. Um, and so, so they're silly, but they're very serious. Like they're, you're supposed to look and laugh and then look again and be like, Ooh, <laughs> Oh, someone's dying. You know, it's like, is it, so you know, it's silly, but not silly. I call the pieces that I do called satiric memoirs. Yeah. And that comes about in that, like I was in therapy for a million years and it's like, I've talked about myself so much. And so it's kind of great to use that context yeah. to make other pieces of work. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Love it. Okay, guys, I really want to say a big thank you for all these things that you've shared with us. I'm, I had a great time and I'm sure that all of our listeners also did. Before closing in, I just wanted to say um, like a big thank you, not only for being here, but also for making the work that you do. Um, I myself um, used a lot of nostalgia in my work, my relationships, my experiences in the past, um, my growing up, my culture, heritage. Um, and I just think that it's going to go forward even more as something that we've experienced, something that I've personally experienced in the past, in the past one and a half year. Um, I just want to say how brave all of you, I would even say that to myself, yeah, because it's not easy uh, to look in the past and to keep digging something that may not uh, always bring the good memories, because I think with every good memory, there's another Another thing that you may be reminded of that may not make you feel as good as the other one. So I just want to say like uh, a big shout out to all of you because it takes a lot of courage to not only dig into our past or our memories, but to make that work and to share that with the world. So a big, big um, congratulations and a big thank you for doing everything that you are. Now... Uh, comes my most favorite part of the conversation is the rapid fire a usual interview on the podcast has a rapid fire which is where we have the most fun but since we uh, we have four guests um we really wanted to inculcate this in the in this program so we thought why not um ask a few questions to each one of you so i request all of you to unmute yourselves um I want this to be like a really fun little um, impromptu session where we can also have some fun. These are very basic questions. Um, I'll ask very quickly and I'll ask your name and I'll ask you a question and I just want you to answer in one word. And um, that's it. That's, that's what the rapid fire will be about. Are you ready? Yep. Yes. Are you ready, guys? <laughs> 
Can I hear a Let's big go. yes? Yes. 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 <laughs> that, that's something. Love it. Okay. So, let's go. Um, my first question is to you, Sarah. If your garden could be a real place in your life, what would it be? Oh, if my you garden could be anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I think I'd like to be in, like, Costa Rica. Oh, wow. Last yeah. Time. Yeah, we we uh once you go there, please call all of us. <laughs> yes, <laughs> perfect. We'll have a group trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So my next question is to you: What is the one thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word nostalgia? Memories. Memories. Love that. Okay, Gina. Uh, your favorite women artist from history. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> personally i want to say Arico, my grandma absolutely um yeah love that okay juliet a food that makes you nostalgic uh a, a pepto-bismo <laughs> <laughs> okay let's, uh, i have no clue what that is but <laughs> It's but tummy I mean, medicine. It's, it's, it's <laughs> medication that eases your stomach. It's like your grandmother makes you take it when you know you're bad. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you don't have it in India, Truka, but it's it's like bubble gum. It's bright pink. It's like the background uh, of my yeah. Thing. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a looking uh food. So that we can take. Yep. <laughs> Got it. Love that. Okay. Uh, my next question to you, Sarah, your favorite book as a child. Oh, favorite book as a child. Oh my gosh. Um, it was one of the Oz books. It was, um, it wasn't the wizard of Oz. Oh, it might've been the scarecrow of Oz. That was my, one of my favorites. Okay. Raisa, if nostalgia was a color, what would you, uh, what color would it be? Yellow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay um dina if given a chance mm -hmm. what era would you like to be born in oh i think now now honestly <laughs> perfect yeah okay my last question to you juliet uh can you name one tv show that makes you uh, still makes you nostalgic friends oh <laughs> love that oh with you on that i'm sorry i guess no act i actually i think all of us okay. have seen it on really different time zones uh, generations but it's still like it it's one thing that connects all of us i think yeah it's so comforting <laughs> yeah that's true awesome you guys this was really really amazing thank you so much for being here with us before um, we let you go, I just had one um, last question. Um, I just wanted you guys to take this opportunity and let our listeners know and our viewers know where, what, what's next coming with you. If there's anything that you're working on uh, that you can share with us and where they can find and follow you. Uh, let's start with you, Juliet. I have some articles coming out, some interviews that I'm working on. I don't have the text right now, but I can send them to you. Perfect. You let me know and I'll shall, uh, I will uh, add them to the show notes. But if it's later, please let us know and we'll keep cheering yeah. for you. Where can, when, you. where can our listeners find you? Um, is there a website, Instagram? Oh, my website? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, JulietMartin.com and my Instagram is remotely Juliet. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Gina, would you, um, would you like to talk about that's coming, something that's coming and yeah. uh, where can people find you um, and anything else that you would like <laughs> to share? Totally. Yeah. Thank you, Shrika. Um, so I'm at Gina Arico on Instagram and it's the exact same for my website, GinaArico.com. Um, and yeah, that's where you'll see 
my upcoming paintings, I'm also starting a group for women artists with mixed identities. Um, and I'm really excited about that. If that sounds like you or you want to know more, get in, um, you know, reach out to me. Let's get connected. <laughs> Perfect. Guys, all these uh, links and everything will be um, attached in the show notes. So um, just if you want to go to a direct link, you can quickly go to the show notes link in the description box below and you can find all the links. Uh, okay, Sara, uh, would you like to share something that's upcoming? Um, um, sure. Everyone? I have a um, solo show coming up early 2022. So stay wow. tuned for that. I'll send out, I'll send out stuff. So that's for my unmasking the self series. Where is it? Then, yeah. So I begun a new series you can see behind me. Yes. Um, this was very much like post pandemic mindset, just like I was very influenced by the desert tra transcendentalists and Agnes Pelton and my meditation yeah. practice, but yeah. also my son has autism. So oh, this kind of like, you know, yeah, he's such a, it's such a spectrum of colors. It's such a yeah. spectrum of different types of people. So I do want to create this kind of rainbow spectrum of colors just to symbolize that we're all so multidimensional we're all so um you know we have different strengths and different weaknesses and um yeah but also influenced by nature obviously yeah. just being yeah. like being joyful in the moment really is yeah. how these came to me can't yeah. wait to see the show please let us know when yeah. it's live and okay, I will. we would love to give you a shout out on the website and on the platform yeah. totally. um, where can our listeners find you Oh, um, on Instagram, I am at Renzi Sanders Art. And um, my website is um, renzisandersart.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. Raisa, here we are with you. Would you like to share something with us that you're, that's coming up? And where can I yeah, find Yeah, so I'm actually completing a mural on Coney Island. And right after that, I have something lined up. It's a, another mural in Bushwick. It's going wow. to be outdoors. And I'm super excited about that. Love and that. I'm in general very thankful that my current body of work is, you know, it's getting the, it's getting the, I guess, the recognition that, I guess, conversation about motherhood deserves. Um, I'm going to be interviewed by Create Magazine. Um, I'm also going to be showing the work at the Affordable Art Fair in Brooklyn awesome. at the end of July. And there's a book coming out, Front of Artists, um, Artists in Studio Edition. I think it's scheduled for end of 2021. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram. It's Raisa Nosova, R-A-I-S-A-N-O-S-O-V-A. -S 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 and website, raisanosova.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Raisa. And I'm so glad to hear all these amazing things that's coming to you. And for all of you. Thank and you so much. I just want to say that all of you have, uh, you all of you really inspire me. And knowing you here seeing you here is i'm just i'm just so excited and grateful and i really want to say a big thank you i want to say a big thank you to all our listeners who waited for this long um who really supported me in during this time and even now um it was all of this uh, support that i've received in the past few months uh, that really that really pushes me every day that i wanted to really do this even when it was really hard and it's been worth it because it's it's just um, I'm so glad that I had this conversation conversation with all of you, and I will see you soon again. Okay, yes. bye bye. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find all the details and links mentioned in the show notes of this episode available on www.arts2heartsproject.com. And if you like this episode, please don't forget to tag us in your stories and leave us a review here on iTunes or any of your favorite platforms. It really helps us to keep the show going. Thank you so much. I'm sending you lots of love and I can't wait to be back here soon again. Bye.